our gang before they head off to their various Memorial Day barbecues, parties, binge drinking, whatever it is they're going to be doing. Uh, they made time for us to be here today to talk about the big stories of the day and the week with our gang. Uh, we have uh, Elaine Wolf, we have Jim Eskin, and we have Doug Ver. All right, so we had uh, City Councilwoman Elisa Chan on the show yesterday to talk about the great Walmart compromise of 2012. I have to say, I, I don't know how I would feel if I lived in that neighborhood at Blanco and Wurstbach Parkway. Uh, do you throw a party because the Walmart Supercenter will only be 165,000 square feet and instead pretty. of 180,000? It's going to be much prettier. And it will be painted in earth tones. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that'll, that'll be the biggest. That'll be the biggest. Yeah, I mean, Al Gore was in earth tones, too. That didn't work for him. But seriously, I, I, I don't know, Elaine. I mean, I guess the way to look at this is they were not going to stop a developer, so they just made sort of lemonade out of the lemons, right? That's exactly what was going on there. I mean, you know, and, and so former Mayor Phil Hardberger, who frankly came out probably with the best win of all, right, because he got these wonderful plums for Hardberger Park that everybody in the city can enjoy. It's not just whether you live in the neighborhood or not. You know, he looked at it, and he said back at the beginning when he first heard about it, he thought, well, we'll stop them by legal means, right? But he's a former attorney. He's a former Chief Justice of the Fourth Court of Appeals. And he sat down and he said, you know, it was a C2 business wanting to go in a C2 location. It's been C2 for like 40 right. years. The landowner's been paying taxes on it for 40 right. years. And he, you know, they checked. He said they, they did. I, there was a headline on their website one day. It said, we spotted a golden cheek warbler, but then it was gone. So, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? You don't have endangered species. The zoning is correct. It's not, it's not a winning battle. You can spend a lot of money on it. So they did. I think they made lemonade out of them. The real yeah. backstory was that they failed to downzone the property around that park when they did that park, and so they, the, 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 this is no accident that you know you build the park and now you've got this development going in right next to it. I, I mean, it really is an amazing, almost humorous, except not for the people who live there, story. Yeah, well, the contract was in process. The sales contract. But was in but who knows if if the people that live there really want it or not? I think there's people that want it there. I, and this, this to me, from the very beginning, this when this thing had no legs other than just a lot of screaming and yelling and yeah. political hay to be made. Well, and there's very prominent political people who feel that really the objection ultimately is not a very pretty one, right? It's like, well, the people who shop at Walmart, we don't really want, you know, coming into our lovely neighborhood. We've got the fancy H&M. Is that on the classist other side. or what? I could guess that'd be classist, right? Yeah. Exactly. But I don't know. You know, the question is, what happens now with Alyssa Chan? You know, I've heard people say that they think she absolutely comes out of this wonderfully, right? I mean, she did forge a great deal out of something that could have been a disaster. Um, other people say, well, let's see. I think she could get a candidate both from the left and from the right. Somebody saying, hey, you should have taken this thing to the mat and absolutely not let Walmart go in. And other people will say. You never should have filed that CCR for the down zone. Jim, would it have been different if it wasn't Walmart? You know, uh, I would have come back. Politics gives us political solutions. It's balancing, competing. You know, it's not, be say, a right and wrong. It's choosing between two rights. Shades of gray. No, I meant if we want or economic Earth. growth and if we want quality of life as designed by aesthetics, it's walking that narrow path in the middle, and yeah. I think that's what we ask leaders to do. Yeah. Do you think most people, when they buy a house in a particular neighborhood, actually are aware of the potential for something like this? Because I know, I've lived here now for 18 no. years, and you, you look around, you see so much green space in San Antonio that you just figure it will always be that way, and it doesn't occur to you that almost every square inch of that land, somebody's got an idea for it, and that's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah, I don't think people really, I mean, they may have some knowledge of what's going around them in, in their immediate area, but no, I don't, I don't think so. You know, with home ownership being such a bad investment now, <laughs> why would you want to own? What are you talking about, Doug? I can't imagine what you mean by that. Well, I mean, it's a gold mine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But on that, people should get involved in their neighborhood associations because that's often where things like neighborhood plans are discussed, right? Yeah. There are neighborhood plans. There is a newer plan for that area that had something not like a giant big box commercial space going in that spot. But yeah, it was mid, we were mid conversation all that and it was just sort of too late by the time it was yeah. underway. So. All right, there's a lot more Gang of Four coming up. It's 10.52, the news and talk of San Antonio 550 KTSA. Weekend AccuWeather says breezy, warm, humid today, 92. We will stay in and around 90 degrees uh, for Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. No big rain chances right now, 74 at your station for severe weather coverage, 550 KTSA.
1108 on 550 KTSA. Our gang of four is with us today. Doug Vera from Rotama Park. Jim Eskin, who publishes the Stratagems newsletter, stratagems.org, right? Correct. And uh, Plaza de Armas TX.com is the online newspaper. Editor Elaine Wolf with us. Uh, and we have Karen Klaus in the newsroom. Karen, say hello to our gang. Gang, hey, say hello to. Hi, Karen. Hey, remember the other day when uh, Marion Barry was in trouble? He had made some remarks about uh, how Washington, D.C. didn't need those uh, Asian stores because they're all dirty. <laughs> well, he's been meeting with the Asian community to, you know, yeah, mend fences and patch things up. It didn't go so well yesterday from the Washington not. Post. Um, He's now having to apologize because after a meeting with Korean, Filipino, Chinese, and Japanese community leaders at a church in Washington, uh, where he did a lot to repair the damage of those remarks, he tried to make the point that our country has a history of racial tensions. Quote, the Irish caught hell, the Jews caught hell, the Polacks caught hell. <laughs> Uh, now the executive director of the Polish American Association is demanding that Barry apologize oh, to the Polish community of the country. Look, I just hope when he does, he does it maybe in writing or something. I remember that great line about Marion Barry, you know, when he committed to take drugs off the streets. Yeah. We right. didn't know he meant yeah. one ounce at a time. Exactly. Right. <laughs> He's apparently still under uh, undertaking that. All right, look, uh, 25 years ago to the day, excuse me, not 25, 33 years ago to the day after uh, Eitan Pates disappears in New York City. We now have this guy coming forward saying, uh, I did it, explaining how he did it. He was a then 19-year-old store clerk. It seems like a completely random, out-of-nowhere act. This guy has no criminal record, has been living a quiet, middle-aged life, has a family of his own. Um, you know, it, it, just taking this admission, it's hard not to think this is somebody looking for uh, looking for attention or looking for 15 minutes of fame. I mean, yeah. it's so it's so out of nowhere, and yet the, the the thirst for a a resolution and a closure to this case is so great. You Just know? go back to the John Bonet Ramsey guy from Thailand, mm -hmm. right? Mark, right. Uh, whatever. Yeah, I got. The, I mean, I can't remember his name, but this is the vibe I'm getting at this point. Has he provided any more details? Because the thing I thought was strange is like, well, I lured him away from the bus stop with a soda, and then I strangled him, which doesn't. I mean, it's that's a very incomplete story. It's yeah. a very incomplete story. Have any more details? Well, you know, we talked to Clint Van Zandt, who was in the FBI, and he was saying this could just be one of those cases where he did tell them more, but it's being withheld, sure. you know, from the public. Mm -hmm. Sh surely there would have to be more. Surely, if you sat in front of police officers and told us, they would be pressing you for more information. It, it, it is something though that, you know, Ray Kelly and people like that seem impressed by this, that they're not going to be easily fooled. So um, if they think they've got a real legitimate suspect, maybe they, maybe they do. We were talking earlier today about whether that case, um, can you really overstate the importance of it in terms of missing children on milk boxes, on TV shows, on posters. You, even when you get junk mail coupons now, they have missing children imprints. Um, there was nothing like that before 1979. Yeah. I think, you know, so I heard, I heard part of that. And the gentleman who called in who said that he doesn't, he wouldn't even let his daughter sleep over at the houses of people that they know. And that, I just felt terrible about that. I mean, what a state to be in. And I think that says a lot about our estrangement from one another. You were talking about how we can get so much information online now and we feel like we know more, but it maybe it just makes us more paranoid and not in a useful way. Right, because, I mean, do, do we really believe our grandparents didn't know their neighborhoods back before the internet mm -hmm. and, and these databases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, and I, you also, I think you said that uh, Clint had said, you know, the number of these stranger abductions has not changed over time. So it's not like we're talking right. about a problem that's gotten worse or gotten better. It is a rare occurrence, and yet we all live in sort of absolute fear of this. So it changes us, though. I mean, we don't yeah. let our kids do the things we were allowed to do even though we think our parents were certainly on top of it and were good parents, but we take way more precautions. We are much more conservative with boundaries and out of our sight and how far you can ride your bike and stuff like that. Is that, is that hurting children, Doug, or is that protecting children? Has oh, that maybe saved lives? I think lives? it is, but there's a lot of things hurting children, like sitting on the couch or sitting in their room all day and, and right. playing electronic games. I right. mean, that may be just as, uh, as damaging. Is there more of that because we don't have this kind of free-range childhood where you're out on your bike all day? I mean, maybe part of this video game obesity thing 
is directly due to the helicopter parenting because at least if they're in the living room eating Cheetos and playing videos, you know where they are. Absolutely. Sure. Well, and I think also, again, we are talking to some degree maybe about something that is partially a class and income divide. You know, I live in a neighborhood that is largely uh, Mexican-American and African-American. It is largely one of the poor neighborhoods. And there, and there are kids out playing by themselves all the time, you know, kids riding their bikes together in groups. I see young, very young kids walking to school. Uh, by themselves, coming to use the park and hang out at the park across the street by themselves. And so I, there is some of that, I think, sort of that, that, that white fear that was kind of so much a part of kind of the 70s and 80s story about inner cities and about all the dangers <coughs> that are out there. So I, so I wonder if it is the same across all class levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about that we know more now, you know, I, I think yes and no. Uh, in a global sense, we kind of know more. but. We don't know neighbors the way we used to, mm -hmm. and we don't interact. It is not as personal, and you know, and that that leads to different type of decision making. So we have a different yeah. kind of knowledge. We have right. the knowledge you can look up online, but maybe we don't know the person right next door mm -hmm. with the level of detail. You don't really know what makes them tick as yeah. a person. I think that's a good point. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think we've we've stopped trusting our own instincts. I mean, are we not capable of walking around our neighborhood and kind of sizing things up and looking at people it, it, and We don't choose to, to live the world that way. You know, we're all, we're doing other things. You know, we, we, we don't have Because you and I grew up in down. the same, yeah. the interesting thing, yeah. Jim and I grew up in the same town in Massachusetts. That's about the only thing we time. agree on. We didn't know each other, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. we're about the same age, same yeah. town. I mean, we rode our bikes yeah. all in the summer yeah. from morning yeah. till dark yeah. and never checked sure. back and we could have been we could have been dead for some. And our parents were fine with that, right? And they were fine with, that, they right? were fine with sure. it. They were not worried about sure. it. Sure. Today, if your kid was gone all day, mm -hmm. by noon you'd be on KSAP, right, pleading for information. I mean, it's just a it's weird. And here's here's an FBI agent saying, you know, the actual problem isn't any worse than it was when you were kids. The number has stayed about the same. Mm -hmm. Well, what, so, so the father, the one who said, you know, even the people that we know, and I thought that too is interesting. When you think about the type of media that we've learned to watch over the years, all the CSI, which reinforces this notion that you might think you know somebody, but really, you know, underneath it, they're a psychopath. And so, and we're not making those personal connections to get beyond just this sort of... Right. Well, and then, and then it's, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword, because if you start to... Let's say I want my kid to play with your kid, so I want to get to know you better so that I will feel that that is a safe situation. My wanting to get to know you better might seem weird, like what's he, what, what is his interest in this? So people, I think, it's, it's very stifling, you know, you don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I, it, seemed, it seemed like maybe before all of this uh, awareness, we were just more, it happened more organically, is that the right mm -hmm. word? Well, you know, the, 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 the was it bowling alone? Yeah. That I mean, in, in one, we're connected in mind-boggling ways, but we're not connected in the way our parents and grandparents were connected. Mm -hmm. And we just, our world is no longer configured to connect like that. Mm -hmm. Well, there also was that assumption that, okay, so our kids go to the same school, we work and then live in the same town, so we're probably kind of alike, and so therefore I inherently trust you because we're probably kind of alike. And that seems to have eroded as well. Right, right. All right, well, we talked this week about, and it's been all over TV, um, a video that went viral. It was made on a student's cell phone. You may want to pull on your headphones for this. Um, in a high school classroom in Salisbury, North Carolina, uh, the teacher has introduced into the discussion current events because they're teaching government and social studies, and they're talking about, at the time, there was that story about whether or not Mitt Romney had bullied a kid in high school, and they're having this discussion, and one of the students is saying, well, you know, in Obama's book, he talks about bullying a girl when he was in high school. And it's the reaction of the teacher to these students having this discussion that has made everybody's attention. The uh, recording. You know what they're going to say. You're not supposed to have a phone in class. You're not supposed to turn it on in class. I predict that we are going to see a real backlash from teachers' unions to the effect that we don't want teachers being recorded. Because I'm not saying this happens every day in every classroom, but I think it happens every day somewhere. I think there are teachers who have this, this lack of whatever you want to call it, skills or background or, or uh, maybe maybe even temperament to be a teacher. And the only way we're ever going to know is if it's documented this way, right? That's right. 
Is that, I mean, is it so, I mean, that's not different from any field, though. I mean, let's just say there are many, many good and great teachers Absolutely. Out there, right? And so we're talking about, well, so there's some, as in any field, there are people who are not well suited to that field and shouldn't be doing it. It's that's interesting what the boy said. I want to play you a clip yeah. of the uh, boy that, that he, he actually didn't make the recording. He asked his friend to turn on his phone. Uh, but the boy that initiated this and was having the exchange with her, Hunter Rogers, he basically says in an interview on Fox that, he had been telling his parents this was going on, but they didn't really believe it. Right. And that's why he persuaded his friend to turn on his phone. Here's what he said on Fox. She, uh, always had about the issue of teachers. I mean, I think it's a great thing to fold into the classroom discussion current events because you want to you want to connect what they're learning to what's happening in the world and how it works. I personally think that teachers should be able to do that and play devil's advocate so that whatever opinions are being expressed, you push back and test the students. they're supposed to do. But you don't ever, in my mind, you don't ever reveal your own political opinions to That's that right. classroom. Is that, is that a fair approach? I don't know that I would have an issue with the teacher talking about, well, here's what I think the facts are in a particular issue, right? And here's how I interpret those facts, and here's how I think about them, provided that they then encourage and help other students to do the same but thing. But when you're a grown-up, and you've got a college degree, and you have a car, and a house, and authority, and you uh, express your opinion and then invite these students who are depending on you for a good grade, I think there's a little bit of a chilling effect, as we say in journalism. I, I think, and what I remember from high school, and it's been a little while now, but I remember wanting to know what my teachers thought. I mean, I wanted to know that sure. there are people, and you understand that. I mean, right. it depends to a certain degree on the age of the student, right? But I think by the time you're talking about upper middle school and high school kids, these are kids who are learning to think critically. We want to encourage them to think right. critically. So I don't think there's an issue with Could a it be a freer exchange, though, if you didn't put your opinion yes, out there? Yes, absolutely. Would, would there be more, maybe, maybe shyer or more withdrawn students would be more likely to speak out? I don't I think it entirely depends how it's done. I think if you actually do it and say, here are my arguments, here's how I put my argument together, let's help you do the same yeah. thing. I don't think that has to be, I think that can actually be help a student learn how to do that. I don't think it has to shut them down at all. So well, I, do, I, I do think it can have a chilling yeah. effect, though, I do. Um, because you're afraid, you're afraid of getting a bad grade, number one, if you disagree with what the teacher thinks. Or conversely, you may just regurgitate what he or she thinks in order to get a better grade. I think it's always best for someone that's in a, in a teaching position like that. And I, my, uh, my sister's brother was a, a college professor for 40 years in, in Oakland. Uh, Caucasian and he was predominantly an African-American junior college and he never ever told them what his own thoughts were but he always pushed back against theirs mm -hmm. just in order to that they could expand their critical thinking. Be the devil's advocate. Abso exactly what you said but he said but what about this or but what about this and he was voted the most popular teacher almost every year. I mean we want to frame this with appropriate boundaries and I guess the way news people used to be perceived how do you present the news? You know, you shouldn't have, shouldn't be your soapbox. Well, and, and, I, and I know that's been blown And if you don't, and the, the reason for that is that you, and I think Elaine will agree with me on this, if you are tough on everybody, mm -hmm. um, then you're doing a better service than simply being tough on one mm -hmm. side or being tough on the people you disagree with. If you're puncturing every balloon and exposing every bit of hypocrisy you find. And I would think as a teacher, you'd be doing your students more of a service if you pick apart their arguments, make sure they really know what they're talking about, do they have the facts, do they understand the Constitution, as opposed to um, saying, well, okay, uh, you're on my side, or you and I are, are like-minded, so I won't, I won't test you as but, much as I'm going to test somebody else. But you don't have to do it that else. way, and I think that if they don't know, I mean, you know, students understand that teachers are people and have opinions, right? And naturally... I thought they lived at the school. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? They used to, I think. But naturally, some arguments will be weaker and others will be stronger, right? Just among students, because that's how and we, we, we want our And so if you don't know, you, right. you can create the impression that a teacher is being tougher on a particular argument, and then you assume that it's because he or she must think a certain way. Maybe it's really just because that's a weaker argument. Maybe they, in fact, right. agree with it and want to make a stronger and argument. We want it's our really teachers true. to be part of the process and to have opinions and to vote one way or the other and to be ideological, you know, one way or another, that's good. I hear what you're saying, but I still frame it. Right? I, would st we? I wish they could just... The, uh, yes, absolutely, but don't you want a teacher that votes? Well, sure, but I'm talking about in the classroom. No, I get you. I would, no, I get I would you. really like everyone who wants to express an opinion to feel as unfettered about that as possible. Well, I think there is some that? fettering you know, who would argue if the with teacher that? Years ago, I, I really didn't care so much about school vouchers and 
probably didn't wasn't important to me, but now every time I hear something like this or I see what's going on, it's just another nail in the coffin for the government-run school system. I mean, it just well, jumps I, I out at you. I'm confused on how for sure this woman is an example of why it's a government-run I gotta, school I gotta, We got to take a break here. That is yeah. a good. You're, you're both making good points, and I think this debate will go on for a long time. Let me take this break. 11:25, KTSA. girlfriendhire.com. Listen to this. For five dollars, five dollars, a woman will pose as your online love interest. She will post to your Facebook page. She will send you romantic text messages. No sex. What a terrific she idea. She will warn other girls away from you or give you advice on setting up your own uh, online dating profile. No in-person meetings, no actual dating, no sex. Just your online girlfriend. Five dollars! The photo's gonna be the problem, because five dollars isn't enough for that to be exclusive, right? Like, I can't make any money if I'm only one person's online girlfriend, so then you gotta worry about the photos, gonna be viral, right? Huh? So, well, Elaine, I've yeah. seen you change your hair color many times, so That's I think... That's true. I could be at least four people. You could be... You, you <laughs> alone could probably uh, knock out four or five of these. <laughs> I think it's a great, I, and I, you know, Taylor's busy, he has no money, he can't, probably doesn't have the time or the money for a serious in-person relationship. I thought to myself, five dollars, this is all he needs. This is half a pizza. Takes the term <laughs> paramour to a whole new level. <laughs> this is, and then you have the whole beard thing, right? For, for gay professionals? Right. What yes. about, what about right. like the five dollar beard? I'm mm -hmm. telling you. <laughs> this is what, forget, <laughs> look, I'm waiting for this IPO. Forget Facebook. I'm waiting Start for the girlfriend hire IPO. All right, Doug, Jim, and Elaine, thank you so much. Great thank job. You, thank you, Thank you. Do a wonderful job. Gang of Four is available as a podcast in the iTunes store and at uh, KTSA.com on the Jack Ricardo page.